Raw Truth podcasts may contain explicit, sensitive, and questionable content. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual podcaster and are not based on the advice of a licensed psychologist, therapist, or other medical professional. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Women's lives follow many paths, twists and turns, and choices never planned nor expected. In life, temptation, anger, depression, and loneliness can lead a good person to make a choice that they can't take back. When facing judgment and isolation, a person can feel very alone. In this podcast, you will hear stories from women who made the choice to cheat on their spouses or partners. Hear their stories. This is Raw Truth, Stories of Female Infidelity. An anonymous and no judgment podcast created and hosted by me, Rebecca Adams. I was an unfaithful wife. You are not alone. Hello and welcome to Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity. Hope everybody is doing well. Everybody is back into the swing of things. It's hard to believe that Halloween is around the corner and that actually the day that I'm recording this is the first day of fall. I love fall. It's my favorite season, but I don't like that the days go so fast and I'm getting older. It's crazy. I know all of us are getting older. Today, we're going to start a new story. It is going to run over the course of three episodes, and it is about Janine. She did a fabulous job writing this out, and it made it easy to read. Before we get started with that, just a couple of things here. Um, over on Let's Ponder with Rebecca Adams, I am working on a topic about female orgasms. And if you have anything you would like to contribute, of course, I have articles and people's thoughts. But did you know that there was also issues and it was called Anna, I always screw this up, I'll have to look again, um, Anna Orgasmia, and that's issues with female orgasms. Um, so if you, I know it's kind of a weird thing like thoughts and I put it on social media and they're like, I like it when she orgasms, but there's more to it. You know, not everybody can easily. Why do you think some women can orgasm easier? I know a lot of women who have affairs tend to orgasm easier, but I believe that is all that excitement and nerves and all of that newness that causes that. And then when we're in relationships for long term, that kind of subsides. And so it gets a little bit harder to get as excited as you once did with the newness. So if you get a chance, shoot me a message, let me know what you think. That episode is set to stream on October 8th. So I will be recording it shortly after you hear this episode, if you hear it at the beginning of the week. So If you get a chance, like I said, shoot me a message. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with Janine's story, part one. I grew up a latchkey kid in the Midwest. My childhood was normal for that time period. The most controversial thing between my parents was that my dad was a Catholic and my mom was a Lutheran. I'm the oldest of two and have fond memories of my childhood. I grew up in a subdivision of a medium-sized city. The neighborhood kids of all ages would roam in large packs until the streetlights came on. My parents provided a safe environment where we felt loved. My dad was a postal worker who worked variable hours and a lot of overtime, and my mom worked at the bank. We went on road trip family vacations every year, and they tried to make sure we had fun. For the most part, we were a happy little family. My parents were seldom affectionate with one another. They slept in the same bed, but it was rare to see them in bed together. I don't remember them fighting much either. If they did, they always kept their voices low and never brought us into their disagreements. My dad was one of nine children raised in an abusive Catholic family setting. He would tell us stories about how his father and the nuns terrorized him. 
He was prone to verbal outbursts when he felt uncomfortable. My mom was careful not to anger him. I remember him always taking his pills wherever he went. My dad had an incident at work which led to his dismissal of service. I knew my mom wasn't happy dealing with his mood swings and emotional issues. She filed for divorce one year after the incident. It seemed she had just put up with it all until my brother and I were old enough to manage. I was 18 and my brother was 15. I always had long-term boyfriends during high school. I lost my virginity to John at age 15. He was a sweet person who treated me well. A year into our relationship, I became pregnant. We were both terrified. Neither of us wanted to be parents. My mom drove me for an abortion. We never told my dad or talked about it again. He and I stayed together for a little longer, but he ended up joining the army and then moving away. I had boyfriends after that, but always avoided casual sex to prevent that experience again. Back then, women were either sluts or teases, so I settled on being a tease. I had a hard time asking for what I wanted sexually because my conception of sex centered mostly around what my male partner wanted. I had read stories of women being able to let themselves go and orgasm continuously, but it was in situations that I was too afraid to bring up for fear of being shamed. Fast forward to 2001. I had just turned 27 and moved to the big city after getting my first real job out of college. I was living with my friend and felt so excited and free to be out of my rural hometown and on my own in the city. My roommate and I were old high school friends who had always had a thing for each other, but never hooked up. We had a lot of fun living together, practicing our adulting skills and exploring the city. I thought he and I might hook up, but out of nowhere, Sean swooped in. Sean was a coworker I met shortly after starting my job. We worked in social services, and he was also new to the city and from a rural setting. We fell in love quickly. I loved his sense of adventure, outdoorsy vibe, and that we were both passionate about the same issues. He was very upfront about the fact that he was divorced with a non-violent criminal history. He'd worked hard after his conviction to complete his education and better himself. He didn't want there to be any secrets about him. I was taken aback by his ability to be vulnerable and not hide from me. Shortly after we met, an opportunity arose for us to be property managers for an apartment building in exchange for reduced rent. I was hesitant about moving in together so quickly, but I also felt the urge to settle down and start my adult life. By pairing up, we were able to pool our resources to stay in an expensive city with low paying jobs. Our friend groups were starting to get married, buy houses, and settle in for the long haul. I felt that was the only way to achieve the American dream. We saved enough money to buy a house, we both went back to school for better paying jobs, and we got married within a few years. All seemed perfect on the outside, but what few people knew was about Sean's explosive temper. He would yell, making me shut down and feel like I was an inch tall. Sean was very particular about his diet, and if he did not have what he needed to prepare food, all hell would break loose. He also liked to stay up late drinking, which always made him grouchy in the morning. I hated having to tiptoe around him, and I am a natural people pleaser who has trouble setting boundaries. I love to spend time with my friends, either in person or on the phone. Sean always felt like I put him last and would say if I tried harder to center him, that he would feel more secure and loved. 
I took that to heart and really tried to be the best wife I could be. I felt like since we were married that I had to deal with emotional outbursts because at least he didn't hit me or cheat on me. Everyone said marriage was going to be hard. If I just loved and supported him enough, he would be the man he promised he was. My first crush while with Sean was a friend of his, Derek. We would make eyes while Sean had his back turned or was out of the room. Derek would look at me in a way Sean never had. He was also much more interested in me and what I had to say. Sean did not care about my opinions. He had a black and white way of thinking. If I didn't agree with him on something, then I was wrong and treated with contempt. I felt guilty about lusting after Derek while I was a married woman. Sean had no tolerance for admiring other men or enjoying them checking me out. The only way this relationship could work was to be 100% monogamous with no outside influences. I was okay with that, as I had never cheated on my boyfriend and looked down on people who stepped out and lied to their partners. John and I had a great sexual relationship. He always made sure I was satisfied. I settled for heavily fantasizing about Derek because the thought of cheating seemed crazy to me. Sean didn't need to know what I was thinking about. I got my first downtown corporate job after graduating with a professional degree. I was so excited to join the team and contribute my talent to an industry I loved. My previous employers did not demand that I dress up, so My work clothes were all comfortable and casual. I took myself shopping with my pay increase and bought suits, skirts, and heels. I loved working downtown, being a part of the excitement. Everyone was dressed up. There were always happy hours or other events happening after work, and I felt as if my life were really starting. I like wearing form-fitting clothing with heels because they made me feel confident, but I also enjoyed watching the reactions from men. I was not used to getting attention from men in the way I was getting it at work. The excitement that would shoot through me produced a heady high. I loved pushing the envelope just a little further each time while still maintaining my innocence. I would come home from work ready for sex. I had confusing fantasies about being overwhelmed, watched, and dominated. The fantasies would make me feel guilty because I knew Sean would be furious if he knew what I was up to. He thought we should be enough for each other and that indulging in fantasies or tempting others would only lead to action. We had our first child a few years later. The birth was very traumatic. Our son was born almost three months premature and had to spend the first several months of his life in the hospital. Sean had just lost his father after a sudden illness. We were both in the depths of despair, but kept it together by focusing on our son and marveling that he was alive, just frightfully small. Our lives revolved around going to the hospital daily, working full-time and maintaining household duties. I immediately was strapped to a breast pump and instructed to pump at least 8 to 10 times per day to get my milk production ready for him. I took immense pride that my milk was sustaining him while battling intense guilt that my body had failed him causing this whole situation. We brought him home shortly before his due date with an apnea monitor. We were so excited to finally care for our baby in our home with all the toys, plushies, and soft blankets imaginable. I was still pumping around the clock while trying to nurse and make bottles of fortified formula to increase his weight. I put on a good display of seeming happy because I didn't want anyone to know how guilty I felt for all of it. 
I was a roller coaster of trying to be the best mom while beating myself up about feeding challenges. Nursing looked so effortless when other women did it, but we were just not able to. I added that on top of the things I felt guilty about. Sean was a loving father and doted on our son. However, he had fully turned to drinking and using drugs to drown his pain. I was jealous of his ability to pass out into a deep sleep while I was awake for days turning into a zombie. I could not relax at all because I was terrified that I would fail our son again. I would anticipate him crying or think, I heard the monitor causing me to stay alert. I didn't want to reach out for help because I didn't want anyone to suspect that I wasn't happy or grateful for my son. I returned to work a changed person. My cute clothes no longer fit and heels killed my feet. Our office moved while I was on leave, causing a reshuffling of the seating arrangement. Upon return, my desk is next to Cody. Cody had been with the company for a long time, but he and I had never spoke. He was previously on the other side of the office in upper management, and we really had no reason to speak. I always thought he was friendly, but very shy and awkward around me. We started talking due to our proximity. He was also a parent with a young child. I enjoyed hearing his stories about the trials of infants and felt a little less alone. He would offer reassuring pep talks and tell me that it would be over sooner than I thought. He was also very funny and made me laugh a lot. I felt guilty about previously teasing men in the office and tried to avoid direct contact or being overly nice. I already felt like I had a reputation, and I did not want anyone to think I was trying to preen for him. A few months later, there was a happy hour after work. There was a bar below our office. Happy hours were frequent and encouraged to strengthen the team. I found myself talking to Cody most of the time. He was so intent on figuring out what made me tick. He would ask me a lot of questions about myself and then really listen to my answers. The conversation turned to who we would sleep with in the office. This was before Me Too. He was looking at me waiting for my answer with hunger in his eyes. I had to stomp on my foot to keep myself from mouthing you. In that moment, I saw lightning strike and felt a powerful jolt go through me as we locked eyes. Things at home were okay. Sean had a stressful job with a terrible commute, so I did most of the child care related work. Sean was great in the kitchen and cooked every night for us, but once that was over, he would disappear into the basement, leaving me to the baby. On the weekends, Sean would stay up late drinking, playing music, and then sleep until the late morning or noon. On the days that I was supposed to sleep in, he would wake me up with a crying baby while frantically looking for a random item or make so much noise that it was impossible to sleep. Sean would get incredibly crabby when things didn't go his way. On top of that, we had completely different parenting styles. He was the high-strung parent while I was the laid-back one. I was often accused of being too blasé, yet he never offered to take over or help in any meaningful way. Neither of us had had experience with kids, and both sets of grandparents lived out of state. It was a hard adjustment, to say the least. Over the holidays, the office was quiet. There was supposed to be another happy hour, but a few people called in sick. Cody and I set up a clandestine plan to slip away to a bar down the street in the early afternoon. It was here that our affair began. 
With no one else around, we were like giddy teenagers quickly divulging deeply personal stories and fantasies while smoking cigarettes in the alley behind the bar. I felt like the version of myself that I had missed. It was the most fun I had had in years, and I told myself that it was all good because I hadn't done anything wrong. Just hanging out with a fun coworker. Cody was also married. He was eight years older than I and held a senior level position. He was always in meetings or traveling, allowing the tension to build slowly. If he was in the office, we ignored each other or gave sly smiles when we passed in the hallway. At first, I didn't think I was attracted to him. He was much bigger and older than my usual type. He usually appeared grumpy with a furrowed brow. In the past, he would walk by me without a second look. Now, suddenly, we were sneaking away to happy hour monthly. I loved the way he came alive for me in private. The furrowed brow would relax and he would make me laugh for hours, strutting around like Mick Jagger telling me his wildest stories and inside work gossip. Nothing physical happened for a while. It was obvious that we were attracted to each other, but I did not allow him to touch me. He would try to kiss me, pitting me gently against the pool table while holding me close. I was so scared of getting caught and ruining both of our lives. I did not want to be an unfaithful wife at the office, and I did not want to hurt his family. I told myself that if we don't get physical, that we're really not doing anything wrong. Inappropriate, yes, but over the line, no. It was not until we took a warm afternoon off work that anything happened. We left at noon, then spent our time by the river. We leaned into each other, sharing our thoughts while smoking a joint. We sat for hours singing along to our favorite songs while holding hands. He walked me back to the parking garage elevator. I was fumbling for my keys when I looked up at him. His eyes were so sincere when he bent down taking me into his arms. The world spun as he kissed me deeply. I pulled away for a moment to get my bearings and then he came at me harder, more passionate than before. I melted into his arms, fully opening myself to him. We kissed the whole way up the elevator. Home life was more stressful than work life. Our son was extremely demanding of our time and he did not like to nap. He was a busy baby, meaning he could turn a room upside down in a matter of moments. He was also an early riser. And I found myself alone a lot with him. I spent that time daydreaming about Cody. He was the only person who made me feel seen. In my reveries, we would be laying in the grass, laughing and kissing. I felt so happy in that dreamlike state. I remember trying to tell Sean about some of the sexual fantasies I had. I really wanted us to have a better relationship because despite my wonderful daydreams about Cody, I still love Sean. I wanted Sean to see me in the way Cody did. I wanted to experience more than just being a very tired new mother with no end in sight. The way Sean looked at me then freaked me out after I told him that I would be open to a threesome and an experience that I would never forget. He immediately started gagging and then exploded into a rant that he would leave me if I ever touched another man and that the desires I had were sick and wrong. The outburst caused our son to start crying. Oh. 
I went to comfort him with Sean following screaming about what a terrible person I was. As I was holding our son, trying to get him to calm down, Sean put up his fist as if he were going to hit me. The anger in his eyes was intense. I felt completely helpless. I kept imagining Cody wrapping his big body around me. Sean would always come crawling back with an apology. He grew up with alcoholic parents who would frequently fight or have guests over that would brawl in the house. I felt sorry for him. I thought if I could provide a quiet, safe home that he would mellow out. He always promised to go to counseling or read a book on anger management. He told me he was terrified of losing me and that if we had a threesome, we would be breaking our sacred marriage vows. He went on to remind me that he was strictly monogamous and that indulging in other behaviors would be grounds for a divorce. I often felt like I walked a fine line between being his rescuer or abandoner. Somehow, I was able to become two versions of myself, work adulteress Janine and home wife Janine. Cody and I carried on our affair right under everybody's noses. When he was in the office, we would slip away into the basement or stairwell to steal kisses or have a wild makeout session. This went on for several months until he told me that he got a promotion and was moving out of state. I was absolutely thrilled to finally end the torture of an office affair, but also crushed to lose him. At this point, he was the only reason I was excited to get up in the morning. It took me a long time to admit to myself that I was in love with Cody. I didn't think it was possible to love two people at the same time. Ideally, I wanted both men in my life. I wish I could say to Sean that I had feelings for another person, but that it didn't mean I had to stop loving him. I really started questioning monogamy, and if at age 36, I was only going to love and sleep with Sean. I wanted Sean and to have more sexual adventures. I wanted to fall in love again, and I didn't see any of this happening with Sean. I do have a deep respect for monogamy, but my interpretation of it meant sharing everything about us, even the scary parts. Sean just wanted me to toe the line and only respect his opinions. I began to pull away from Sean and no longer shared anything about myself. I would lay awake at night thinking about Cody, wondering what in the hell I was doing. I wanted to run to him and proclaim my love. But what to do about our spouses and children? Cody didn't share much about his married life, but it was clear to me that he would never leave his family. He confided that he and his wife rarely had sex and did not share a bedroom, but that leaving was out of the question. I felt a similar way about Sean and me. We had signed up for all of this, so we had to stick it out. And that ends today's episode and part one of Janine's story. I will be back in one week for part two. On Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity, I share stories of women who have been unfaithful to their spouse or partner. I give them a safe space to be able to explain what happened and why they chose the direction of infidelity. But I also feel it is just as important to understand what the betrayed husband or partner faced when he uncovered the truth. A few weeks before our child was to be born, Maria and I were getting our things ready for a little getaway in San Antonio, Texas. She left the house to do some quick errands but she left behind her Apple Watch, and I logged into the device. I saw text messages from her ex-husband. It was a picture of him on a tractor holding a baby. The text message said, Remember. I was really disappointed. When she arrived back home, I didn't say anything about the text message. When we left and were just a few hours away from San Antonio, I asked Marie if she had been texting with her ex-husband. 
She told me no, she hadn't been. To hear exclusive stories of the men's discovery of female infidelity in their relationship, have early access to regular episodes ad-free and more extras, subscribe to my Patreon by visiting my website, rawtruthstoriesoffemaleinfidelity.com. Subscription pledges start as low as only $4 a month. You have been listening to Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity. Your support of Raw Truth Podcasts is truly appreciated. When you visit the website, rawtruthstoriesoffemaleinfidelity.com, you will find the story guides to help form your story, where you can subscribe to Patreon for exclusive episodes, and to vote for the podcast to be in the Hot 50 Countdown for Podcast Magazine. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my other podcast, Let's Ponder with Rebecca Adams, where taboo topics are discussed. To submit your female infidelity story, share feedback, or have general questions about the show, please email rebecca.rawtruth at gmail.com.